Um, you may turn your Bibles with me to James chapter 1. And as I was looking at this uh, book in a fresh way, I shared with you last Sunday from verse chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 12, about how the Lord tests wisdom that he wants to share with you and I, and he wants to test it in our lives to make it like gold. And that wisdom comes in the forms of trials. Today we're going to look at another way that we are tested, but it's not from God. God does test every man, Psalm tells us. The Lord tests every man. And it tells us that he tested Abraham when he asked him to uh, sacrifice his son Isaac. But God does not tempt any man. And there's a big difference between God's testing in our life or Satan tempting us. And I want, by God's grace, together with you to look at this difference and make it exemplary so that in every one of our minds, we automatically know, we're trained to know the difference when it comes to us. Because every day, you and I face that difference. Every day, God tests us. And every day, we are tempted. And we must know the difference. Or else, we'll receive something from our own lusts and from the devil, thinking it's from God. And we'll receive something from that temptation and be drawn into sin and the end of it is death. We experience death in a small area of our life or in a big way in our life. But even more tragic, I think, I don't know if it's more tragic, it's just as tragic, is that when God wants to test us, we reject it and blame the devil. And we give the devil credit for God doing his marvelous, wonderful work in our hearts, and we reject it over and over and over again. We reject God doing his testing work in our lives. And if we reject God, we fight against God in our life. And it's just as tragic as yielding to temptation and letting it lead us to sin and experiencing death. Both result in death. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ in his life in us. Very important to know the difference. And to not only know the difference, but to grow in the knowledge of this. I find in my life it's not a one-time experience. You must grow into it. And as the tests are different in our life based upon where we are in life, Let's say, for instance, you're single. You're not going to be tested in a way that a married man is, both in the relationship with his wife and his children. The tests will be different or vice versa. Maybe you're a single lady and you're not a mother, and so you're not experiencing those kind of tests, but you are experiencing tests that we married people don't experience. And so the tests develop as we walk through seasons in our life but so do the temptations. And so this is a growing experience. It's not a graduation where you go through school and you study the word of God for a season, you figure this out, and now you have the answers and you're prepared to go through life and no more learning. That's not what it's like. This is a continual growing in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus and his will for our lives. James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm going to write this down. Tempted. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. He himself cannot be tempted by evil. God is never enticed with sin. It doesn't ever have any attraction to him whatsoever. 
You and I can't understand that because from the moment we were born, we were born with a nature that is tempted by sin from the first we can remember, right? How long does it take for a little child to become angry? To throw a fit, we call it. How long does it take for that little child to rebel and shake their head no to dad and mom? Not long at all, right? It happens very early in life. So early the child doesn't even remember it. It's there though in their nature. You and I cannot comprehend a life with no temptation to sin. But we should. And we can. In our natural mind, we cannot understand this at all. But 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, The natural man cannot understand the things of God and neither does he know them because they cannot be received in our natural mind, but they are revealed to us by the Holy Spirit in our inner man. We can, in our inner man, get a grasp. And this is something that a lot of Christians, I wonder how much grasping they do. I think it's probably weak in our Christianity today. You know why? Because we haven't we haven't exercised ourselves in this area of knowing the difference that God tests and receiving his testing and not yielding to temptation and thereby we remain weak and we can be much like the Hebrew Christians when the Hebrew writer wrote to the believers in the book of Hebrews chapter 5 he said when you ought to be teachers of others you're still babies drinking milk of the word. Why? Because you haven't exercised the word of truth, thereby discerning between good and evil, sharpening your discerning skills. And if you and I do not exercise that, we'll never have a grasp or a gaining knowledge of what it means to live a life where temptation becomes weaker and weaker and weaker in our life and testing becomes stronger and stronger and stronger and more received until the final test. Are you willing to die for Jesus? That's the final test. Are you willing to give your very body, your whole life for what you believe that Jesus, for who you believe Jesus is? And what he's done for you. That's your final test. Will you die in strength of that faith? Or will you die struggling with that faith? The difference is. Many people face cancer. Or other sicknesses. Illnesses that are terminal illnesses we call them. There's no hope for them to live. They're going to die. Do you know how many Christians struggle intensely to decide whether this is from God or from the devil. Many. Because we live in a diluted, in a delusion in Christianity where the gospel is preached that Jesus wants to heal you, but you're the problem. And it's not true. They don't believe in the testing of God. If that were the case, not one of the apostles would have been killed. If that were the case, the history of the church would look drastically different. It would be filled with millionaires and billionaires and people who lived for 700 years or a thousand almost like Methuselah. He would be the most spiritual man that ever walked on the face of the earth. But he wasn't. Enoch, his father, was. It doesn't tell us that Methuselah was. Though he would live for 900, someone know? 969 years. Good job, Addy. 969 years. Can you imagine living that long? You and I can't imagine that today anymore because, think about it. We're in 2019. Subtract 969. Someone do it with your calculator real quick. Tell us what year you would have been born in. Can someone do that? We're 2019 and subtract 969. Hmm? 
950? 1050. You were close, Josh. Banker knows his numbers. You were born in 1050 AD. Do you realize what you would have all experienced, guys? <laughs> we, we live such brief little moments in life. We think we're old when we're getting close to 70. We're not old. We're still babies. No, I was having babies at 500 years old. I'm serious. Now the flood, the Lord changed it all after the flood. In Genesis chapter 6, he said, from now on, man gets too wicked when they live so long. So I never again am going to have a man live that old. From now on, his days will be at 70, or if by reason of strength, he will live to be 90 years old or 80 years old. But I think the max that the word there, the, that the word gives is 120. And indeed, that's about where people died. Moses was an old man, Joshua. But as time goes on, our life seems span, seems to become more brief. I have no idea where I was going with that thought. So I'm just going to move on. <laughs> Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. Let no one say it. Do you say it though? If you don't know the difference, you'll say it. And this is tragic for our lives. So this is a, this is a study, dear brothers and sisters, that is really important in our lives. It's the difference between life and death. Many times. Whether it's in a little area of your life or in a big way in your life. Like I said, let's say you get terminal illness. That's where I was going with this. The church would look drastically different, I was saying, if God's blessing would be a physical blessing only. And it would be there in the length of days of life, or it would be there in how much money you have, but that's not the history of our church. The family of God that we belong to, that we're born into when we're born again, that family's lineage, the, their lives, go back and read them. Many of them were killed very early on for their faith. If you would have been born like Methuselah in a thousand something, 50, you would have experienced and seen the church go through intense times of persecution to the point where the Bible that could be read, that you could read, unless you were a trained priest and knew Latin well and learned to read it, you had no Bible over the whole world. The common people had no Bibles. They couldn't read it. You had to come and ask the priest what it said because you couldn't even understand it. The Word of God was so diminished. However, the Word, spoken Word of God was not diminished in those times. And there were men and women who heard the voice of the Lord Jesus speak into their hearts and obeyed that word and gave their lives for it. They gave their lives. They laid down their lives for that word. And so you and I also, in discerning this difference, will lay down our life when tested and will run when tempted, will flee temptation. Or will resist it, as James tells us, to resist the devil like Jesus did. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lusts. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Actually... I'm going to do it this way. Tempted, lust, death. Those are the three that we see progressions. One is tempted because 
of their own desires. That's what the word lust means, when you have a strong desire for something. And it leads to sin, which leads to death. So I'm actually going to do this. Tempted. I'm going to put sin in here yet. Lust, sin, and death. Now this morning I'd like to look at how that Jesus gave us a pattern to not sin. There was only one man who lived a physical body who never sinned. His name is Jesus. And the word of God is very clear. He was without sin. However, he was not without being tempted. But for Jesus, temptation never went to lust. That's how he withstood temptation. That's why he never sinned. Though he was tempted, being tempted is not sin. And this is also confusion where Satan loves to come in and bring a false condemnation on us as God's children that when he comes and he tempts us with a thought, whatever it may be, maybe it's a covetous thought of someone who you see something that someone has and you desire it. And God had given Israel a strong command, do not covet, right? It's, it's that Ten commandments, it was, do thou shalt not covet. And then later on, he goes on, he says, don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet his animals. Don't covet his wife. Don't covet his children. Don't covet his money. He gives us a whole list. Don't covet anything. Can any of you stand up and say, I have never coveted? Not even once have I had a strong desire for something that I seen someone else have and I didn't. That's what coveting is. That sin is called lust. Jesus never coveted anything from anyone. Because he guarded and resisted, he guarded his heart and he resisted the devil with the word of God, he was never led away by his own lusts. But each one, verse 14, is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own covetousness, his own desires. Do you remember what Jesus said? Is one thing that will surely choke out the word. In the parable of the sower, he said, the seed which is th sown on thorny ground, where thorns grow up, they do what? What are the thorns that can choke out the word of God? What is it? Any thorns in your life that have ever choked out the word of God? Jesus meant gave us three things. Let's look in Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus gives us the list of these three things. Mark chapter 4, verse 18, and others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word and the, someone say it, cares of what? Worries of the world, the cares of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches. Ah, you've been deceived. You thought riches was God's blessing. Deceitfulness of riches. And the third? The desire for other things, covetousness, will always choke out the word. For other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. You hear it, but you never can do it. Why? Because you've been choked, and you can't breathe. And if someone's in a chokehold, they can't do much. He's held captive. You might not die immediately, but you're not going to... You're not, you're not free to go anywhere. You are being joked out and held captive. And these three things will do it. The word of God will be choked out and held captive from being lived out in your life if you have lust. And the problem is 
Sometimes we think this desire for other things is actually godly. It's actually godly. And it may have a godly motive. You may want to serve the Lord in this way. But deep down in, it's a strong desire that comes from within yourself. Instead of an act of obedience to the Holy Spirit that crucifies yourself. There's a big difference. Obedience to the Holy Spirit always puts death to self. Remember that. Obedience to the Holy Spirit always puts the desire for yourself to death. Now, you may, it may lead you into enjoyment, just like it does to our children. Sometimes we tell them to go out and play, and they go out and they have a lot of fun. Sometimes the Holy Spirit says, go out and play, and you enjoy yourself. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a strong desire that you want from something. Some people may want to serve the Lord in a certain way and have a strong desire, but it comes from themselves, and it's not an act of obedience. And that fruit, the act of obedience, will be choked out. And the desire for something, whatever it may be, even a spiritual one, will not bring forth the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, patience, goodness, faith, meekness, They'll all be snuffed out of your life. That fruit, you won't taste in that desire. Big difference. So, I would like for us to look at Matthew chapter 3 and see how Jesus resisted temptation. Actually, Matthew chapter 4, sorry. Verse 1. Let's look at how Jesus resisted temptation. And I want to take a look at all three of these temptations and why I believe that God recorded these three. Because I do believe that Jesus was actually tempted in all points, like as we are, like Hebrews chapter 2 says, yet without sin. So he experienced every temptation that any man or woman ever faced on the earth. Maybe not in the specific little one, but for instance, he experienced the principle of it. He experienced the temptation of pride. He experienced the temptation of discouragement. He experienced the temptation of the deceitfulness of riches. He experienced the temptation of covetousness. All of those things he experienced, perhaps he never well, we know Jesus never had a baby. So you women, he's like, well, he can't relate to that. No, but he can relate to the experience, the spiritual temptation that may come to you through that experience. That's what I'm trying to say. He never drove a car, I don't believe. So he may never have experienced someone cutting him off, right? So we get hung up and the devil actually deceives us by thinking we, we're experiencing something Jesus must not have and so can't relate to me. Not true. Every temptation that you're experiencing in the details of life, he did experience that temptation. Or Hebrews is a lie. But the book of Hebrews is not a lie. He was tempted in every temptation. And you and I have been tempted only in those temptations that are common to man, he tells us. So let's look at these three, because in these three, there are three principles of temptation that are very common, but these principles are foundational. What I mean by that is, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 5, that to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, are all the law is fulfilled in those two. And so I see them as two pillars. Love God, love your neighbor. And everything in our life is built on those pillars. It's always a question of, does this, is this an act of love towards God that I'm called to do? Or is this an act of love towards my neighbor? And everything we do and everything we say is built on those two. Principles of our whole life. Well, these three are three temptations that are kind of 
envelop our whole life. Every area of our life is affected by these three. And when you resist them the way that Jesus did, they become three pillars of your life. Three strong armories. I'm going to call them this because this is something that we can relate to if you know a little bit of American history. They become three forts in your life. You remember in the, in the old days when they developed the West, as the settlers came out and settled the land, they were spread far and wide apart. And their neighbors sometimes they couldn't even see. And so what the U.S. government did is they sent out some soldiers in different places, like Fort Collins. This was one of them. Fort Laramie. Fort Morgan. So in Colorado, we have these towns now who are called Fort Morgan, Fort Lupton. The reason they were called that is the government had established a place where they built a wall and stationed soldiers, and this became a fort of protection so that the settlers in that general area, when there was going to be a raid by the Native American Indians, people could run to the fort, shut the doors, and have some safety. And God told Israel to make these kind of cities as well. Once they got into the land of Canaan, they were to have what they called refuge cities. That if someone accidentally killed someone or their animal, someone was angry with them, they could flee to the refuge city and there they'd be safe. They weren't allowed to be killed. Now, not if it was intentional murder, but only accidental happenings in their life. God still has refuge places for you and I. And that's why when Paul told Timothy, flee youthful lusts, he didn't just say, run for your life out everywhere, nowhere, without any direction. No, no, no. Flee youthful lusts and pursue, he said. I want to show you that word while we go through here. In 1 Timothy... Uh, sorry, I think maybe it's Second Timothy. Let me find it here. Second Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 22. Second Timothy, chapter 2, verse 22. But flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. You see, you're not just fleeing lust. If you just run away on your own ideas and say, I'm being tempted right now. Get me out of here. Where should I go? I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go for a drive or I'm going to go there. Many people have tried that. I've talked with many young men, especially in fleeing youthful lusts where they've tried ideas to get themselves out of the natural circumstance that they're in that was tempting them. Never worked. Never works. You must flee in your spirit to God. That's where you must flee. You must flee with this pursuit. Do what is right. Righteousness. Faith. Love. You must flee to the word of God and to God himself. And that's where your help will come from. Not just changing your circumstance. Now the Lord may lead you to change your circumstance, but don't look at that as the end, the means by which it will give you victory. It won't. The circumstance change will not give you victory. So what I'm talking about is you must flee with a pursuit into the refuge that God has made for us. Because like Psalm says, God is a refuge, a very present help in time of trouble. God is our refuge. That's where we escape temptation. Now, going back to Matthew chapter 4 and looking at Jesus and how he related to it. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I want you to notice something. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He was not led by the Spirit into temptation. You must see the difference. 
If you believe that God will lead you to temptation, you'll receive that experience as from God, and it will be an angel of light, but he'll be the devil coming to you as an angel of light, and he'll be tempting you, and the result will be you'll be carried away with your own desires, it will become sin in your life, and you will experience spiritual death in that area of your life. And at the end, when the whole thing is dying around you, you'll say, whatever happened? God, you cheated me. You will blame God for the experience. You see how the devil comes as an angel of light? The one goal the devil has in God's children is that they blame God for something in their life. Oh, the devil will get a foothold, a strength of advantage over your life if you allow him to cause you to lead you to that place where you blame God for anything in your life. Everything that Job experienced, everything, it tells us. And Job, let's look at this word in Job. I want to read it to you so I don't misquote it. But this is a, an amazing statement. I don't know how many of you have read the book of Job lately or have identified with him in your life. But if you have, then identify with these words. In Job chapter 2, verse 9, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God. God and die. Now you think, well, I'm not going to curse God. By blaming God, you are attributing this curse on God. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And in another place, in another version, actually, the, the New King James Version says, neither did he blame God. So, Satan did not, I mean, he, Jesus was not led into temptation by the devil. He was led into the wilderness and he was tempted. I'm sorry, let me say this again. Jesus was not led by the Spirit of God into temptation. He was led into the wilderness and in that wilderness experience, the devil came and tempted him. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, see, he wasn't tempted immediately. I believe that Jesus was having a really sweet time with God in the wilderness. And I'll tell you why. In Mark, Mark records it this way. Look how Mark records it. I'll read it to you. In Mark chapter 1, verse 12. And immediately the Spirit, after he was baptized, the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts. And listen to this. And the angels were ministering to him. It wasn't a, an isolated experience that he was tempted by Satan. He was all by himself. The angels were also there. And the tempter came and said to him, If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. The first temptation that Jesus faced was a very natural one. Food. Food was his first temptation. Or earthly things. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul says this about some who were professing Christians. Actually, in Philippians chapter 3, he says, verse 18, For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Why? Their end is destruction, death. That's the end. So he starts with their end. But what took them to the end? Their God is their appetite for earthly things. Whose God is their appetite, 
whose glory is in their shame, and listen, who set their minds on earthly things. They're drawn away by the desire for earthly things. Lust. So not only food, but we could say earthly things. You and I, one of the umbrella temptations that we have in life, and especially right when we're born again, the Holy Spirit puts such a strong desire for us to read the Word. And to have communion with and fellowship with God. And you know what the basic temptation that comes to us is? The desire for other things to choke out the word. The busyness, cares of life, the worries of life. They hit us first. But I want to show you how Jesus resisted it. Not just the word in which he resisted it. The obedience of life and faith that he resisted it in. So that he did not sin. Remember, he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, some Christians are doing that today, and they shouldn't tell anybody if you're doing it, because Jesus said, if you fast, don't do it to anybody. Wash your face so that you don't look like you're fasting. But if you're doing that, that's wonderful. But you get really, really hungry after 40 days and 40 nights. Really hungry. Jesus was very hungry. His body was in a place where it really desired not fantasies, not a steak dinner, just some bread, just something to eat, some solid food, a basic life desire, a good thing. Eating bread isn't sin. You see how the principle I'm lying out with you? The devil won't come to you necessarily and say, go commit murder. He won't say, go commit adultery or fornication. No, no. To the new believer who is new in Jesus Christ and to those of us who have been walking with Jesus, the basic principle of temptation comes in the normal necessities of life. Do you understand that? If you understand that, you'll see and be aware when those temptations come. And you'll be able to resist them with this truth. Not only resist it, but overcome it with this principle of truth. And you obey the Holy Spirit leading you into this experience like Jesus did. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Do you believe that? Now, Jesus didn't say man should not live by bread. No, Jesus quoted the word of God to him. I want to show you this verse in Deuteronomy. Very important uh, word so that you and I, it gives light to this temptation for us. In Deuteronomy chapter 8. Look at this word. God is saying, uh, speaking through Moses and he's saying this in verse 2. And you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you. He leads you into the wilderness. God does. Jesus was led there to be tested. Satan used that opportunity to tempt him. It indeed ended up being a test for Jesus because he did not yield to temptation. Every one of these experiences, dear brother, sister, will end up testing you, purifying you, making you stronger, or tempting you, leading you away with your own desires, making it sin for you, and you'll experience death. One or the other will happen. God wants to put us into all these places. He leads us there to test us. That's what he did with Israel. He led Israel to the wilderness. Did they run there away from, running away from God? No. God parted the Red Sea. They were led there by the cloud and the fire pillar by night. God led them there to test them. 
but for them became a temptation. And you know what happened? They yielded to temptation because they lusted, led to sin, and experienced death in those places. Jesus did exactly the opposite. He allowed it to test him, purify him, and it became an overcoming strength. So here's the word Jesus was quoting. That he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you be hungry. He humbled you and allowed you to become hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand God was giving Israel an understanding of something, but they didn't get it. That he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Do you get that? That's what God was trying to teach Israel, and they missed it. You know what they did? They grumbled, they complained, and God had to discipline them, and many died there. They weren't satisfied with the manna that God was giving them to sustain on the heavenly angels' food. No, they grumbled and complained and said, Someone give us meat! They were, had their minds set on their earthly condition, and they complained. Jesus did not. And so he quoted this word to the devil and overcame this very basic life temptation because he lived by the principle, man shall not live by bread alone, but there is a way I will live, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now look at your life, dear brother, sister. Are you living by the principle that man will not live by earthly things, food, your own appetites, whatever it is, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? Is that how you live every day? Every one of us live one or two ways on this. We live, we eat to live. Every one of us eats every day, unless you're on a special diet or fasting, right? But the normal thing of every day is eating. Why do you eat? To live. But if your life if your spiritual inner man is not eating to live, like your physical body is eating to live to survive, then your mind is more set on earthly things such as food than it is on spiritual food. And you actually are not like Jesus overcoming this basic life temptation. Because the way Satan wants you and I to live is like everybody else lives in this world. We eat. We live to eat. We know we live in a world like that, especially the culture of the United States. There is every food that can be thought of and things that probably haven't even come up yet with offered to you and I. There's not just one. There's like 50 different varieties in which you can make your coffee. A very basic element to live, right? We think so. Most people in the world feel like they can't go through their day without coffee. It's become like a, 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 this, you know, thing that in which gets us up in the morning and gets us about our day. Is that how you get up? Is coffee more important to you than the Word of God? How you live proves to the devil and to God how you believe this word. If you can get up and walk through your day, but you've got to have coffee, but you don't need the word of God, then you're not overcoming the very basic principle. You're actually yielding yourself to the temptation. You have set your mind on food and earthly things to survive your day, but you can survive without the living manna from heaven. You won't overcome this temptation. And all kinds of earthly things enter into there. And then you wonder why things of the earth upset you so badly. 
You wonder why you're depressed or feeling so discouraged when you don't make money that day or things just seem to go wrong. You wonder why you've, you're feeling upset, maybe because the meal isn't quite ready and you get to have all of these food possessive disorders. That's really what we call them because they are a disorder, right? We get all upset and affected by how our food tastes or if it's not ready or if I can't have this or that. And my, your appetite is ruling your day. It's your God. Just face it. Because our problem is we're deceived by it. We don't see it this way like Jesus did. And so we don't think of it as our God. It's just our life. Everybody lives like this, we think. But in reality, it is our God. It affects us more than God does. That's how you know something is your God. Something in life affects you more deeply than God himself with his living word. And this is how Israel lived in the wilderness. And you know what it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? A very important word for you and I right now and in our life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he tells us, he warns us, warns us of this word. He says in verse 5, Nevertheless, with most of them God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us, that we should not crave evil things as they also craved. Not be idolaters, verse 7. Verse 8, not act immorally. Verse 9, not, nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed. Verse 10, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages had come. Therefore, to him who thinks he stands, take heed, lest he falls and is ensnared in the very same thing. See, I've seen in my life that if I live by the basic principle of having my mind set on earthly things and I'm affected by earthly things. That's what Colossians chapter 3 tells us. Set your affection upon things above. That means the things that affect you. And a hundred, maybe a thousand lesser evils will affect us deeply and will be led into temptation by our own desire where Jesus was never led and therefore never sinned, and therefore did not experience death. The second one that Jesus experienced in Matthew chapter, as recorded to us in Matthew chapter 3, let's turn back to that, is also one of those forts, as it were. So I, I want you to think about this. This is a fort in your life. You might be out there throughout the day doing all kinds of things. But when Satan comes to tempt you with a desire for earthly things, you can flee that lust and flee into this fort called man shall not live by earthly things, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Let it be a stronghold, a refuge for your soul every day. The second one, Matthew chapter 4. Sorry, I'm all over the place. Matthew chapter 2, 3, no. Matthew chapter 4. The second one, and then the devil took him, verse 5, then the devil took him into the holy city, and he had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. The third one, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, and he said to him, all these things will I give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God 
and serve him only. Then the devil left him. Behold, angels came and began to minister to him. I'm going to save the other two for later. Because I think this one bears us walking through this week, thinking about this, praying about it. Search me, O God, and try me. You know that word that David prayed in Psalm 139? Search me, O God, and test me, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me into the way of everlasting. Dear brother, sister, if you and I really set our mind on heavenly things this week, it'll change a lot of things in our earthly life. It might change the way you eat, but it will most certainly change how you think about food, whether it's physical or spiritual. What I really want you to think about is not be taken up with the temptation. Jesus wasn't taken up and thought and pondered a lot about food. Bread, 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 bread. Someone give me bread, bread, bread. Oh, that bread smells so good. Those rocks look so tempting. Oh, I could just say the word and I'd have bread. Fresh bread. Have you ever had a fresh loaf of bread lately? right out of the oven, butter melting over it, bread, put on some honey and butter and jam. Doesn't it sound wonderful? I think your taste buds are flowing, are they? Mine are. Don't be taken up, dear brother, sister, with the temptation. Be taken up with the cure, the delivering power from that temptation, your refuge city, the word of God. And you will. You and I, every one of us who are born again will make those decisions every day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We will make a decision whether to live by earthly things or whether to live by the word of God. You'll make that decision. And the result of your everyday experience will either be this journey tempted, lusting, desire for other things, sin, death, or you will reap life everlasting. I got to say this word in closing because the Lord brings it to my heart. Romans chapter 8 is a principle, is a law of the Spirit as sure as the law of gravity even more sure, because the law of gravity will fade away. This will never go away. For those, verse 5, for those who are according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. That's how to be for you and I. Life and peace. Christ's very life and his peace ruling, governing our attitudes, our thoughts, the motives of our heart. May the Lord give you life and peace. And he will if we walk after the Spirit.